please let me welcome you to our afternoon session. That the name of the session is Interculture and Interfaith Dialogue, Freedom of Religion and Women's Right. Another crucial topic regarding freedom of religion or belief. And it's my great honor to welcome here for the opening remarks our Deputy Minister Eduard Hulitius, Deputy Minister of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Mats Brown, Director of the Institute of International Relations, Prague. This institute was crucial for organization of whole ministerial, and we uh, will never stop to thank you for uh, your great team and support that you gave to the topic of freedom of religion, I believe. Uh, your Excellency Deputy Minister, the floor is yours, please. Welcome to the Deputy Minister. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We are very honored and happy to be able to host you and your discussions. Uh, I am particularly glad that I got the chance to open this uh, part of the conference on freedom of religion and women's rights. Uh, those of you who were at lunch and walked to the lunch and from the lunch back, so at one of the halls, one of the corridors, you could notice two pictures, two pictures which are, which I almost always stop by them. One of them is called No Mercy and the other is called uh, a Mercy. And, but one of them, you could see a group of armed men who are stopped by a woman in black from entering uh, a room where a wounded uh, person, wounded man, maimed man, is uh, lying. And that's uh, Duchess uh, of Polixena of Lobkowitz, who uh, at the day of Prague defenestration of 1619 hit one of the Royal uh, of the royal governors of Prague after they were thrown out of the window. She hid them in her, in her room as a Catholic and she didn't allow the Protestant rebels to enter and finish the job. That's the mercy. And then there is no mercy. And there you can see a group of armed men, this time Catholics, who are, who are uh, ripping away a group of women, old, young, and children, away from their house, from their palace. Well, these are the widows and family of the Protestant rebels who were defeated, whose property were confiscated, and new Catholic aristocrats came and became owners of the grand palaces and halls in Prague, and the families, composed now mainly of women, were just thrown away. These two pictures show how when you have a religious clash, when you have a religious problem, it's women who are most often the victims. The victims and those who are at the biggest loss. Ladies and gentlemen, the right of freedom of religion or belief has often been understood to involve uh, inherent contradictions with women's rights. Those working for the promotion of uh, freedom of religion or belief, and uh, those working for gender equality have rarely worked together. In fact, they often, not sometimes, but often work against one another. Large parts of the women's rights movement have paid little attention to religion as anything other than a source of harmful practices, discrimination, and patriarchy as something women should be protected from. And on the other hand, Advocates of freedom of religion or belief have often overlooked or sidelined women's rights in their promotion of freedom of religion or belief. Some have seen struggles for gender equality as a threat to the protection of religious values and practices. However, when we look at what, bring, what the religion bring, brings, what are the inherent values of religion and what are the inherent values of uh, freedom of uh, women and other minorities, we shouldn't find contradictions. They are often the same. Women have a stronger voice in society today than they had, than they had a long time ago, and religion remains uh, and 
growth in many parts of the world as important feature of uh, people's life and of their freedom. We have seen sometimes, well, unfortunately, often, not sometimes, we see the clashes between the, uh, the, the religious beliefs and uh, pressures for women's rights, for example, in Iran. They spark women's rights protests, both in their country or uh, across the globe. And they remind us that uh, the situation when, as I said, the contradiction when people are fighting for freedom of belief and freedom for women shouldn't be there and they are very hard to be found. So in this situation, it's crucial that the international community works together to address the human rights violation against women and against religion as well and support efforts which improve the status of women and which improve the freedom of religion in societies so that we live in peaceful, harmonious societies which bring happiness and success to all. By working together and speaking together, and discussing and comparing, we can create a supportive environment for women's participation in public or political life and also build further bright future for freedom of religion, of expression of belief and all these values which represent our civilization, which represent the prosperity and progress of the way how men and women together form life on this planet. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Minister. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, allow also me to welcome you to this conference intercultural and interfaith dialogue, freedom of religion and women's rights. I will start with a quote. Human rights are praised more than ever and violated as much as ever. This is a quotation which I begin with for two specific reasons. First, it's a quote of the late uh, Swedish foreign minister, Mrs. Anna Lind, who was murdered more or less exactly 20 years ago. And I mention this quote for two reasons. The first reason that this is an event which is, among others, supported by Anna Lind Foundation. And secondly, I think this quote is illustrative also of a change in times. I'm not sure that this quotation is as valid today as it was when it was expressed something more than 20 years ago at the beginning of this millennium. I'm not sure that the beginning, the first part, human rights are praised more than ever, is as accurate as the description today as it was back then, 20 years ago. The second part, unfortunately, uh, human rights violated as much as ever, however, remains very much uh, valid, unfortunately, also today. I think not only here in Czechia, we have had a debate about a question of if foreign policy should stress, and in this country, that is stressing the heritage of Václav Havel, focusing on values of democracy, human rights, or, on the other hand, take a more pragmatic turn, stressing more issues relating to security, economy, etc. And indeed, if we go back to, to when this quotation comes from, to the beginning of uh, the millennium, we were very much at what could be labeled the height of a liberal world order, with, in general, a clear stress on human rights and a rule-based order. But I think this, this dispute, this opposition between viewing on the one hand a focus on democratic values, human rights, and on the other a stress on security to be very much misleading. And this also, if we stress human rights in the perspective of also applying to women, that is women's rights, uh, 
from that perspective also we can stress what sometimes is referred to as the Hillary Doctrine or Clinton Doctrine uh, after the former American State Secretary Hillary Clinton who tended to stress that to promote the role of women is also a way to achieve democracy, stability, and in the end, also security. Why do I mention this? What well, I mention it to stress, but I think it's important that we have a conference in such times as we have today with so many conflicts in the world that targets the issue of freedom of religion and women's rights. I know this is a much more complicated topic, and I'm curious to hear what speakers have to say on this in a short while. I will finish what I have to say here by reaching out and thanking the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the co-organization of this event. I would also like to thank my colleague from the Institute of International Relations, Clement Stoyer, for his work on this event together with the other members of the team. I will also stress a thank to the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance and the Anna Lind Foundation for supporting this event. I will now introduce our next speaker who is with us through a video recorded message because unfortunately Professor Asadie Kian Thiebo, uh, who is Professor of Sociology and the Director of the Center for Gender and Feminist Studies at the University Paris Cité in France could not be with us today, but I would like to invite her and ask uh, the organizers to, to uh, turn on her recorded message for us to hear that. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to give a talk on Iranian women's struggles and movements. I'm so sorry not to be able to be with you in person. Uh, and I am Duas giving a very short talk on Ira Iranian women's uh, movements. Uh, the murder of Jina Massa Amini, a young Kurdish Iranian woman arrested in Tehran by the morality police for improperly wearing the veil and beaten to death on September 16, 2022, provoked major demonstrations of anger and protest throughout the country. As a sign of rejection of political Islam in power since 1979, many young women removed their compulsory veil, the ideological symbol of the Islamic regime, and demanded freedom, including freedom of choice. Although Iranian women's revolt, like their counterparts in the Middle East, has never really stopped since the late 19th century, this time they are at the forefront of the movement. Indeed, women participated actively in the nationalist constitutionalist revolution of 1906, the first in the Middle East, airing demands both for the transition from an absolutist regime to a parliamentary monarchy and for women's civic, social and political rights. However, in Iran, as elsewhere in the Middle East, nationalist movements in which women participated and to which they tremendously contributed have often betrayed women's causes that they champion. This betrayal encouraged women political activists to distinguish between these two political projects, with some creating autonomous structures, such as women's associations, journals, or even girls' schools. Urban women also participated massively in the 1979 revolution, which again betrayed women and imposed regressions on the rights, but provoked crucial social and demographic change in their behavior, mainly thanks to the expansion of education and urbanization. The modern Iranian society, with aspirations to political modernity, is paradoxically ruled by archaic institutions and laws. The Green Movement of June-July 2009 against the massive electoral fraud in the presidential elections was a social movement that attempted to reform the system from within. It also expressed specific demands of the educated middle-class women against discriminatory laws and for gender equality. These demands had been aired 
by women rights and feminist activists through several campaigns, including the One Million Signature Campaign or the White Scarves Campaign. The Green Movement was crushed, several women's NGOs were closed down, and many women's rights activists and feminists were forced into exile. From December 2017 onwards, some young women called Daughters of the Anglob Avenue expressed their discontent with the imposed Islamic, Islamist precepts by removing their headscarves in the public. The majority of modern Iranian society, educated, open to the outside world, but suffering from poverty, unemployment, and corruption of an oppressive ideological and Talibanized power, reject political Islam and demand the separation between state and religion. Through acts of resistance and civil disobedience, a growing number of women try to take control of their destiny, including their bodies and sexualities. Through performative acts, they transgress the imposed Islamist norms, unveil and refuse to hurt their bodies. They even sing, dance, and utter the urgent need for freedom. In the ongoing revolution, where women have emphasized their importance as major political stakes, woman life freedom, borrowed from the Kurdish feminist movement in Turkey, has become the major slogan in all demonstrations and gatherings targeting the Islamic regime and its leader. A consciousness has emerged according to which democracy, freedom, and social justice are closely intertwined with gender, ethnic, religious, sexual, and class equality. The harsh repression of demonstrators and opponents is likely to slow down the revolutionary process, but will not be able to prevent its deployment sooner or later. In Iran, like in other parts of the Middle East, women are major agents of social, political, and cultural change. The future of the Middle East belong to women. Thank you very much. So thank you to Professor Kian Thibault for this video address. I would like now to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Rola El Husseini Dean, uh, Associate Professor at the Department of Political Science, Lund University, and also affiliated to the Center for Middle East Studies at the same university. Professor El Husseini Dean has been working on topics related to women's right, in, rights in the Arab world, the concept of state feminism, and the role of women in the Arab Spring. I would like to introduce, uh, so welcome you to the floor now, to, to, to take the floor and, and take the word. And I would also like to include, uh, in, invite my colleague, Mr. Stoyer, who will moderate the keynote speech. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. I'm honored to be among such distinguished guests and speakers. Before I start my talk, I would like to express my gratitude to the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Institute of International Relations in Prague, especially to Dr. Clément Stoyer and Jan Daniel for this kind invitation. I'm also grateful to the staff at the Institute for their help with logistics and travel. They're the unsung heroes of these conferences. I was tasked with speaking uh, about freedom of religion and women's rights. Precision language, I think, is very important, so let me start by defining what I mean by freedom of religion and women's rights. Freedom of religion is simply a fundamental right. We're all entitled to worship, practice, and observe our religious beliefs as we wish. By women's rights, I simply mean that women should be entitled to the same social, political, and economic privileges as men. When it comes to freedom of religion, I propose that women should have the same right as men to practice their religion. This implies that women should have freedom of movement. They should be entitled to an education and to work, and they should be free to vote and hold public office. And I'm uh, including all this under bodily autonomy. Women should also have control over their own bodies, including reproductive rights, and that is bodily integrity. So I define bodily autonomy as a person's capacity to make his or her own decisions in relation to their body. For example, the ability to dress as one wishes. 
And a person's bodily integrity as a person's exclusive use and control over his or her own body, taking decisions that affect the body, for example, medical decisions. My talk today is in three parts, and it is centered around three concepts. Gender washing, double standards, and choice. The talk examines the intersection of religion with the two axes of bodily integrity and bodily autonomy. Now, on the first day of the conference, the UN Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion, Professor Nazila Ghani, mentioned, and if I understood her right, that there's no distinction between authoritarian and non-authoritarian regimes when it comes to freedom of religion. She also stated that liberal values are not necessarily mutually exclusive with authoritarianism and talked about the existence of authoritarian practices in democratic regimes. Now, as you all know, women's rights are infringed upon in many parts of the world. This is especially the case in authoritarian regimes, but we also see it in democracies. And women's rights are constrained often in the name of religion, or sometimes in pursuit of an anti-religious ideology. Therefore, my examples are drawn from places I know best. The Middle East and North Africa, or MENA region, which is my area of specialization and my point of origin, and the West, which has been my home for over three decades. I will therefore discuss the two main regional powers in the MENA region, namely Iran and Saudi Arabia, in addition to France and the US. So my examples will be drawn from these four countries. In this talk, I will make connections, equivalences, and parallelism that you might, may find provocative. This is to stimulate debate, so I hope you'll bear with me and we will have a lively Q&A session. So let's start with gender washing. In September 1995 at the UN Fourth Conference on Women in Beijing, then US First Lady Hillary Clinton famously declared, women's rights are human rights. This came to signal the point where Western powers began to emphasize women's rights as part of their promotion of the so-called Western values of democracy and human rights. This connection between democracy and human rights was made clear in American foreign policy at least since the US invasions of Afghanistan and then Iraq. The somewhat contradictory statements made by US officials and important administration figures at the time on the reasons for these invasions point to a confusion about the relationship between democracy and women's rights. The famous radio appeal made by then First Lady Laura Bush in November 2001 explicitly linked the plight of Afghan women and their right to dignity and freedom to the war in Afghanistan. The speech was rightly criticized by observers and scholars for instrumentalizing women's rights, for political purposes, and for putting a feminist glow on a brutal bombing campaign. It was rightly condemned by scholars for portraying brown or Muslim women as needing to be quote unquote saved uh, by white men from brown men to use the terminology of Lila abou and Gayatri Spivak. This speech served to expand the military response beyond the boundaries of Afghanistan and made a call to action on behalf of women everywhere in the non-democratic world. The same argument was then used in Iraq, where the Bush administration positioned itself as the defender of women. Thereafter, Muslim women in Afghanistan and Iraq became the symbols and pawns of US democratization efforts and attempts to project soft power. Now, the EU has also been promoting democracy in the so-called neighborhood since 1995, and since the inception of the policy that targeted the European, uh, Mediterranean, uh, the European southern neighborhood. Sorry, this policy was called the European Mediterranean Partnership, EMP, and in this policy, um, the, the link with a democracy was made very clear. The EU has also made clear in separate policy documents the importance of women's rights, especially when it comes to democracy. In fact, gender equality is at the core of European values and is enshrined within the EU's legal and political frameworks. These values have been articulated in the three gender action plans issued by the EU since 2010, with the latest one, Gender Action Plan 3, issued in 2020. While the implementation of these EU gender plans was not as effective as intended, these plans nevertheless show the importance of gender rights for the EU, at least at the discursive level. So gender equality and women's rights have become a norm that the EU was intent on promoting. Why am I talking about all of this? For a simple reason, these norms of gender equality and women's rights have become so influential 
that they have swayed the thinking of many authoritarian leaders, especially in the Arab world. The aspiration to be perceived by the international community as conforming to international norms on gender rights explains the sudden moves by Arab states to promote women's rights. So after the year 2000, we see an exponential increase in the use, for example, of gender quotas as an instrument to increase women's political participation. The percentage of women in Arab parliaments exponentially increased from less than 7% in 2005 to over 18% in 2022. Yet it is still the lowest in the world, preceded only by the Pacific region at 20% and Asia at 21%. So this tendency to use gender quota accelerated after the so-called Arab Spring, when countries that had previously not used gender quotas suddenly implemented them, if only for a short period. This was the case, for example, in Algeria, which employed a 30% quota for the 2012 legislature before canceling the quota system altogether in the next cycle. So what explains this sudden interest in quotas by Arab regimes, which are often quite authoritarian? And are these quotas effective and meaningful? I argue that the need to correspond to the norms of human rights and gender rights promoted by the West led Arab regimes to weaponize women's rights. Hence, modern autocrats in the Arab world are more likely than their predecessors to adopt gender equality reforms to boost regime legitimacy. This is a form of what the French scholar Amélie Le Renard has called women's rights washing and what the Swedish scholars uh, Ellen Björnegård and Per Zetterberg have in a 2022 piece dubbed autocratic gender washing. This concept simply means that taking credit for gender equality progress enables autocrats to devise legitimation strategies aimed at specific groups, the political opposition, civil society and citizens, but mainly international actors. Hence, these authoritarian states instrumentalize women's rights to gender wash neoliberal authoritarianism. And these strategies have become more prevalent in the aftermath of the so-called Arab Spring, when they became part of the many counter-revolutions that we saw in the region and their corresponding projects of authoritarian renewal. These strategies of gender washing were especially prevalent in the case of countries like Saudi Arabia or Egypt. Now, in the past couple of decades, Saudi Arabia implemented an implicit gender quota in its consultative council, which gave non-binding advice to the king. Today, 30% of that council is female. Does that mean anything? Not really. In its most recent parliament, Egypt has 27.5 parliament, uh, female parliamentarians, and other Arab countries also have uh, large percentages of uh, women in their parliament. This is all due to the use of explicit gender quotas in legislative elections. Does this gender washing critique mean we should disregard quota and discard them as an instrument to increase women's representation in politics? I think the answer is more complicated and nuanced than that. Quotas are crucial, and when they are dropped, we see the number of women in politics plummet, as was the case in Egypt, for example, in 2012, when the number of female MPs dropped to 2% because the quota system was abandoned after the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak. Egypt quickly changed course and reinstated quotas in 2015, and the number of parliamentarians went up to 15% immediately. And while women elected on quotas in these authoritarian regimes may not be effective politicians and may not legislate in ways that improve women's well-being, their symbolic presence in parliament has value. They provide an important role model for girls and young women and point to a future where women can imagine themselves playing an important role in politics. They also habituate people in highly patriarchal and misogynistic societies to the presence of women in the public sphere, especially in politics. And also, they can eventually help make legislative changes that give women more rights based on more modern interpretations of religion. Quotas are, however, not the only instrument of gender washing used by these authoritarian regimes. In some cases, they have used other rights to showcase their progressive chops. Under the current crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, known by his initials MBS, patriarchal interpretations of Islam which limit women's autonomy have been discarded. For example, Saudi Arabia allowed women to drive in June 2018 and eased the guardianship system in August 2019. 
Women no longer require permission from a male guardian to travel abroad and can apply for a passport without authorization. As the US Commission on International Religious Freedom noted in a November 2020 report, quote, reforming guardianship laws would demonstrate unequivocally that the Saudi government understands that freedom of religion and belief, especially for women, is a right, not a privilege, end of quote. However, I do not believe the Saudi government has understood that freedom of religion is a right. Uh, the women who fought for the right to drive, for example, were imprisoned and tortured and remained in prison after the new law was passed. The most famous of these women is Lujain Hazloul, who since 2014 had advocated for the right to free movement and the right to drive. She was arrested in May 2018 and charged with attempting to destabilize the kingdom. Note the date, May 2018 was a month before the crown prince announced that women would be entitled to drive. Nevertheless, she remained in prison until February 2021. I should point out, since we are in the Czech Republic, that uh, her activism has been recognized. And in April 2021, soon after her release, she received the 2020 Václav Havel Human Rights Prize. So why were Lujain and other women's rights activists arrested? I maintain that the Saudi crown prince wanted to make sure the people understood this right to freedom of movement was a grace from the royal family and the crown prince. Hence, women's bodily autonomy in this case becomes a largesse granted by the state in the person of the crown prince and not an inalienable right that women are entitled to possess. In his attempt to present himself as the face of a more moderate, and modern Islam, MBS granted also his people freedom from the so-called religious or morality police, known colloquially as the Mutawir. Its official name is the Commission for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice. And its mission was to enforce a Wahhabi understanding of Islamic morality by enforcing gender segregation uh, and checking women's hijab. This institution was created in 1940, gained power in the 1980s, and then its power was suddenly curtailed in April 2016, when societal reforms by then Deputy Crown Prince MBS were put into effect. So the Motawa then lost their right to pursue question, ask for identification, arrest, and detain anyone suspected of a crime. And these men who once elicited terror have been sidelined as restrictions on women's rights have been eased. So all these changes are a result of what is called Vision 2030, which aims to better the lives of the Saudi people and according to its architect, MBS, bring society back to a more moderate Islam. However, I maintain that this desire for a moderate Islam in Saudi Arabia is a smokescreen for MBS's attempt to present a modern benevolent face to the West, one that is supported by gender washing. So let me wrap up this section before moving to the next one. The international community should therefore approach changes made by authoritarian regimes with caution. Changes that look positive may simply be a way for the regime to appeal to the West and to clean up their image. In other words, a simple PR move. These forms of progress are still progress, albeit forms of progress that can be retracted by the regime because they are not hard won by public demands. However, this instrumentalization of women's rights by Arab regimes should not blind us to the occasional double standard of the West. Because of this double standard, Arab states and other authoritarian states can feel justified in cynically using women's rights as a PR move. They can point to so-called improvements in political and other rights, such as freedom of movement, to showcase progress in their country. And I'm sorry, but I just... So let me move to the next section, which is on double standards. In the past couple of years, two states, one from the Middle East and one from Europe, provide us with two sides of the same coin when it comes to women's bodily autonomy. I'm speaking here of Iran and France and their treatment of women's rights to choose what to wear or how to cover that body in observance or not of their religious beliefs. So let's start with Iran. Soon after the Islamic Revolution of 1979, the newly created Islamic Republic implemented a compulsory hijab law, forcing women to cover their hair and bodies with a semicircular cloak 
called the chador. And while women wore this loose garment, garment often in the early years of the Islamic Republic, its wear became increasingly the purview of women in the holy cities of Mashhad and Qom. In other parts of Iran, and as time went by, women started wearing coats and scarves and pushing the limits of what is permissible. Young women who had been born and raised under the Islamic Republic started to flout the rules. They uncovered half of their hair, colored it, put on makeup, and played with the style and length of their coats. This behavior was somewhat tolerated under so-called reformist presidents, such as Khatami or even President Rouhani. It was often curbed under so-called conservative presidents, such as President Ahmadinejad or the current president of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi. It is therefore not surprising to see in 2022 the guidance police of Iran, the morality police, try to enforce stricter laws of hijab. This attempt to regulate women's bodily autonomy culminated in the death of a young woman, Masa Amini, also known under her Kurdish name, Jina Amini. She was mentioned by the previous speaker. Amini was visiting Tehran when she was stopped in September 2022 for improperly wearing the hijab as part of her hair was showing under the scarf. She died, as we all know, in suspicious circumstances after her arrest, and her death triggered massive nationwide protests in Iran. This became known as the Zan Zendegi Azadi movement, and I apologize for butchering the Farsi, or women, life, and freedom. And while Iranians had been recurrently protesting over the past decade, starting with the so-called Green Revolution of 2009, followed by the protests in 2017 and 2019, the women life freedom protests were unprecedented in terms of spread and size. Female protesters, including teenage girls, played a key role in the demonstrations, and school girls protested in large numbers for the first time. Over 500 people died as of September of this year, including at least 68 children. Now, Iranian women's demands for freedom and bodily autonomy were heard all over the world and received a sympathetic ear, especially as the body count went up. In support, women all over the world used the hashtag hair for freedom and chopped their hair in public, as some Iranian women had started doing to protest women's death. And as these women that chopped their hair in public included Iranian women in the diaspora, but also politicians such as the Belgian foreign minister and a Swedish member of the European Parliament. Other high-profile women who cut their hair in protest included French movie stars such as Academy Award winners Juliette Binoche and Marion Cotillard. Now, probably influenced by this large social movement supporting women's rights to bodily autonomy, the Nobel Prize Committee, Peace Prize Committee gave the 2023 prize to one of the Iranian champions of women's rights in Iran, Narjis Mohammadi. The Norwegian uh, Nobel Prize Committee stated they gave her the prize, quote, for her fight against the oppression of women in Iran and her fight to promote human rights and freedom for all. Now, that, the fact that French movie stars such as Binoche and Cotillard were moved by the plight of Iranian women in, in light of the large popular protest is not unexpected. After all, women all over the world sympathized with Iranian women's just cause. What was surprising was that, was that these movie stars had not considered and were not moved by the right to bodily autonomy of their own compatriots. Since 1989, and what has been dubbed l'affaire du foulard, or uh, the issue of the scarf, France has been debating the right of women and girls to wear a headscarf or a hijab. Now, as you might know, in France, there is a strict constitutional separation between political power and religious organization based on the law of separation of church and state of 1905. This 1905 law is itself grounded in a movement towards secularization, dating back to the French Revolution of 1789. It arguably devised modern French laïcité or secularism. It guaranteed freedom of belief, the freedom of worship and practice, and posed the principle of the separation of church and state. This law is often brought up in the French media and political debates when it comes to the wearing of the veil by Muslim girls and women, especially in institutions and schools. Now, the veil controversies in France date back to 1989, when three teenage girls were excluded from school for wearing a hijab a headscarf. 
The school principal argued that wearing a veil is incompatible with the good functioning of a school and that the girls should respect the secular character of the institution. A compromise was eventually reached and the girls were enjoined to take off their hijab when entering school and then put it back on when they left school. The issue was heavily debated in the media and the French public was divided over it. Now, while this polemic could arguably be understood as protecting the underage girls from their family's influence and encouraging them to choose for themselves, the following controversies showed that the issue of veiling was being instrumentalized by the French state and by public intellectuals to impinge on the freedoms of Muslim women and especially impinge on their bodily autonomy. Such polemics on the veil could be linked to racism against the Muslim minority in France, which itself is a result of the French colonial past. So in 2003, 2004, this is when the French government established the Stasi Commission, composed of 20 members and named after its president, Bernard Stasi. The goal of the commission was to reflect on the concept of laïcité in the French Republic. And the commission submitted its report in December 2003, after which a historical account of secularism in France, uh, sorry, which after a historical account of secularism in France discussed two main principles. The first principle is the neutrality of the state, which imposes on the Republic to ensure the equality of all its citizens before the law. And the second principle is freedom of belief. The commission recapped the tensions that exist between the neutrality of the secular state and freedom of belief, and found that these tensions are mainly found in specific institutions, such as schools, prisons, hospitals, and the army. So following this commission's report, the French state passed a law in March 2004 on what is called wearing ostentatious religious signs in public schools. This meant that schoolgirls could not wear headscarves, and Jewish boys could not wear yarmulkes or kippahs in schools. In the following years, and in excessive interpretation of the law, girls wearing long skirts or dresses were sent home because their clothes were associated with a Muslim dress code. So this law was taken a step further recently, actually at the start of this school year, when the French Minister of National Education, Gabriel Attal, forbid the wearing of abayas, or kaftans, long loose dresses, to school. The decision was the object of much derision on social media among French Muslim immigrants and in the Arab world. Photos of Brigitte Macron in long evening dresses, images of kaftans made by major French haute couture houses were shown with the caption, abaya ou pas, is it an abaya or is it not? In September 2000, uh, 2023, the French Council of State, the top administrative court, upheld the decree barring girls from wearing the abaya to school and seeing it as part of a logic of religious affirmation. Again, this debate about wearing long dresses within the school system could be justified as protecting influenceable minor girls from being steamrolled by their families into veiling. But other laws passed by the French state are less easily defended. So in October 2010, France passed a law that forbid wearing the niqab or face covering, a more extreme form of veiling in public space. Notwithstanding that public space is a legally dubious concept, this law impinges on women's freedom of religion and affects their choice to cover up, and therefore their bodily autonomy. What makes this law egregious is that according to the French newspaper Le Monde, the estimated number of adult women wearing such forms of veiling in 2009 in France does not exceed 2,000 women. In all of France, this is out of a population of over 60 million people. Uh, but perhaps the most ridiculous infringement on women's uh, bodily autonomy in France uh, concerns what is known as the burkini. Now, for those of you who do not know, the burkini is a full body swimsuit, a swimming cap and wetsuit, such as the one you would use for surfing or diving. And it has sometimes a little skirt around the waist to cover the genitals. The word burkini is a portmanteau of burqa and bikini, and the swimwear was created in 2004 by a Muslim Lebanese Australian. So in summer 2016, 20 French cities on the Mediterranean, including Nice and Cannes, issued local ordinances banning the wearing of the burkini on beaches. 
The ban came in the wake of a terrorist attack in Nice when a truck plowed into pedestrians, killing 86 people. And the Burkini ban was supported by several politicians, including then Prime Minister Manuel Valls, who said, quote, the Burkini is the expression of a political project, a counter society based notably on the enslavement of women, end of quote. He also asserted, quote, that the Burkini was not compatible with French values, end of the quote. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed, and in August 2016, France's highest administrative court suspended the ban on the Burkini in the town of Villeneuve-Loubet. The court rightfully found that the Burkini ban seriously and clearly illegally breached fundamental freedoms. Yet the fact that such bans were passed in the first place shows that secularism, the secularism of the French state has been instrumentalized by different political actors. As Amnesty International's director at the time said, quote, French authorities must now drop the pretense that these measures do anything to protect the rights of women, end of the quote. In addition, such, um, we have recent legislation such as the law consolidating the respect of Republican values, which was passed in August 2021. It's also known as the anti-separatism law, and it extended religious neutrality beyond civil service, weakening freedom of association by imposing state controls on religious gatherings. So this changing interpretation of laïcité uh, has led to a toughening of the legislative narrative on the visibility of religious signs. Most political parties in France have today joined forces to essentially make Muslims, especially Muslim women, disappear from public spaces. So this 20, the 2010 uh, face covering law, the 2016 Burkini ordinances, and the 2021 anti-separatism law, all of this reminded me of a discussion I had with a fellow graduate student when I was studying in Paris. She was a sociology of religion student and said that France is not laïc or secular, rather it's a catholique, in a play on the word Catholic and laïc, which in French would be catholique. In other words, France is still influenced by its Catholic past and is couching its rejection of other religions in the name of secularism. This rejection of the other is simply a cover for French racism and Islamophobia. Indeed, the theory of the grand remplacement or great replacement that has been adopted by the far right in several European countries and most recently in the US originated from France. The theory espoused by French writer Renaud Camus states that the white European populations are being replaced by people from Muslim majority countries originating from the MENA or Sub-Saharan Africa. An October 2021 survey found that 61% of the French believe that the Great Replacement will happen in France, and 67% of the respondents were worried about it. Now, France does not allow the collection, the official collection of ethnic data in censuses, so the exact number of Muslims in France is not known. Yet the Muslim community is estimated to be around 10%. So talks of replacement are obviously exaggerated. They are simple dog whistles for racism and Islamophobia. Muslim women are the weak link as they are visible religious minorities. They wear their beliefs literally on their bodies in the form of the hijab. Regulating their public observance of what they understand as a religious commandment is an infringement of their bodily autonomy. The US Commission on International Religious Freedom has flagged this infringement on bodily autonomy in a November 2023 report on religious garb restrictions and in a February 2022 hearing on anti-Muslim policies and bias in Europe. The report also mentions Austria's face ban, but does not bring similar bans in other European countries, including Belgium, Denmark, or Germany, for example. In all these cases, the number of women who wear the full face veil is very small. For example, the newspaper The Guardian estimated the number to be around 100 to 150 women in Austria, and the BBC estimated the number of women wearing the full face veil to be around 30 in Belgium. So we pass laws for such small numbers of people. However, this non-issue is hyped by politicians, often in connection with a right-wing Islamophobic discourse. 
I should note here that while the US is critical of other countries' freedom of religion issues, it is itself not immune to problems due to religion, even though American problems are linked to what I'm calling a tyranny of religion rather than a freedom of religion. The two cases I presented here are on opposite extremes of the spectrum. If we are to argue for preserving women's bodily autonomy, then women should be allowed to choose what to wear or not to wear, regardless of the official religion of the state, be it Islam or laïcité. The double standard of the international community vis-a-vis -vis this issue is perceived as hypocrisy in the Muslim world at large, and especially in the MENA region. While we cannot compare the physical repression and violence of an authoritarian government like the Iranian regime to the attempts of the French democratic to, uh, state to regulate Muslim women's bodies, these attempts are both, nevertheless, forms of state violence. The public in the developing world, especially in the MENA region, is more politicized than it is in the West. This public follows the news religiously, and members are very active on different social media platforms. They can see the hypocrisy of the international community and the double standards it applies to so-called pariah states, such as Iran, and good states, such as France, and often point out such double standards in their posts. So I think the West should be careful not to be seen as setting different standards for itself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Such behavior encourages authoritarian leaders to engage in practices like gender washing. So, both France and Iran violate their citizens' bodily autonomy, if in different ways. In Iran, women are forced to adopt the values of the state and therefore obliged to wear a veil, even if they do not want to do so. By trying to impose French values on Muslim women, France is taking away their right to choose and curtailing their body auton autonomy. So this issue of choice is the topic of the next part of my talk, a woman's right to choose what to do with her own body, in other words, bodily integrity. So as we saw from the examples above, religion or its flip side, secularism, play an important role in justifying the interference of governments and the rights of women to bodily autonomy. But governments also intervene in women's bodily integrity, often in the name of religion. So let's start with the US. Western governments often argue that their societies are based on a separation of church and state, as is the case in the United States of America. I argue, however, that the wall of separation between church and state in the US has been thinning over the past decades. Today, most Americans, about 69%, according uh, to a Pew survey, think the founders of America intended for the US to be a Christian nation. And more than four in 10 think the United States should be a Christian nation. However, many of the US founding fathers were deists rather than Orthodox Christians. And they made sure to include Article 4 in the federal constitution, which prohibits religious tests for political office. Yes, religious tests are implicitly run for US presidents. When JFK was elected, anti-Catholic prejudice was still very much in the mainstream of American life. And such prejudice affected the campaign as some people feared Catholic prelates would dictate policy, an issue Kennedy himself addressed in a speech in Houston in 1960. He was the only Catholic to ever be elected to office until Joe Biden. When Barack Obama was in office, his Republican and conservative opponents tried to taint him with the brush of Islam by often emphasizing his middle name, Hussein. In other words, despite the official separation of church and state, those who are seen as deviating from the WASP mainstream have been seen as suspicious. The growing influence of evangelical Christians in American politics and their alliance with the Catholic Church has meant that some issues, such as abortion, have become a lightning rod in American culture wars. This led to a change in laws after Donald Trump and the Republican-controlled Senate appointed a conservative Supreme Court justice, which brought the Supreme Court into the camp of the social conservatives. So we have the Dobbs ruling passed by the US Supreme Court in 2022, which took away women's right to abortion granted in the US Supreme Court ruling Roe v. Wade of 1973. After this ruling, we read the harrowing stories of women in conservative states 
where the right to abortion was rolled back. In my husband's home state of Texas, a state where I spent 10 years of my life, a woman was forced to give birth to a child with anencephaly, or without a brain and a skull, or a brain and skull that did not fully develop. Another Texan woman who had what is called a missed miscarriage was forced to look for over two weeks for a physician willing to remove the remains of the fetus who had died in her womb. Physicians were refusing to perform the simple procedure because those doctors who violate Texas's abortion laws can lose their medical license, face up to 99 years of prison, or incur fines of at least $100,000. Of course, these laws disproportionately affect low-income women who cannot afford to go out of state to get an abortion. If you have the money, you fly to Massachusetts or any democratic state, and you get an abortion. In short, these women's body bodily integrity was threatened in the name of the religious beliefs of some Americans, a minority of Americans, in fact, as 65% of American citizens surveyed say that abortion should be legal. These women's choice to terminate unviable pregnancies was taken away from them by the state. So the desire to meddle with the bodily integrity of women by American religious fundamentalists is also present in the current jeremiad against trans people in the US. This has resulted in new anti-trans legislation designed to prohibit gender-affirming care across multiple American states, forcing families to relocate across state lines and to protect their children. Why am I talking about trans people? Because I'm going to talk about Iran and gender-affirming surgery, which is a very surprising thing for most people. Surprisingly, Iran is one of the few countries in the world where gender-affirming surgeries are officially recognized and given religious sanction. In fact, they are sometimes subsidized by the government. <coughs> People with gender dysphoria can transition from male to female and vice versa. And while intersex people have been allowed to undergo a sex change since the 1930s in Iran, the practice was restricted to intersex people until the 1970s. However, in the 1980s, then Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa, or religious edict, that allowed all transsexual Muslims to undergo a sex change operation. This was due to the activism of one person, Fereydun Mulkara, later Maryam Khatun Mulkara, who wrote to the Ayatollah a couple of times before meeting with him. Khomeini listened to Mulkara's story and consulted with three of his trusted doctors before issuing the fatwa in 1982 that allowed Molkara and all transsexual Muslims in Iran to undergo a sex change operation. Maryam Molkara was even gifted a chador by then President Khamenei, later Ayatollah Khamenei, the second supreme leader of the Islamic Republic. In other words, by gifting her a chador, he recognized her as a woman. Although Maryam did not undergo the operation until 1997, over a decade after her fateful meeting with the Ayatollah, her activism thrust Iran into the role of a global leader in sex assignment, reassignment surgery. There's a long process of over two years of medical examinations before a person is allowed to transition. But transgender people in Iran today get a new birth certificate after the operation, in addition to a new identity card and a new passport. They also receive a loan provided by the government to finance the surgery. So while Maria Molkara managed to get the state to recognize transgenderism, it would take Iran's patriarchal society much longer to accept it. And this is where we have a difference between the state and the society. Transgender people in Iran have difficulties finding jobs because large segments of the population fear them or are disgusted by them. Additionally, they have trouble getting married as they cannot uh, find a partner. Uh, many of them, their partners do not accept them because they're not cisgender. In other words, while the Iranian legal system does not ban transsexuality and sexual transition, transsexuals suffering from gender identity disorder encounter social and cultural problems, both in their private and public lives. So as expected of a patriarchal society, trans men are more accepted than trans women. Trans women who are assigned male at birth are seen as a source of shame by their families. And that is why, in addition to being beaten up and insulted, they are often not accepted. They must resort to survival sex so as not to starve to death. 
Trans men, in contrast, are less marginalized. They both resist and reinforce Iran's dominant gender norms by conducting themselves in a quote-unquote manly manner and criticizing cisgendered men. They, they seem to glorify mustaches. They also think of themselves as more real than trans women whom they stigmatize. According to recent research, they problematize patriarchal cultural values that feed into the creation of a phallocentric masculinity while at the same time abiding by a traditional heterosexual form of masculinity. Now, it's important to criticize Iran's openness to sexual reassignment re surgery. I'm not saying that Iran is a utopia. Don't get me wrong. The rise of the Islamic State resulted in the suppression of all non-heterosexual forms of sexuality. This means that consenting adults participating in same-sex relations could receive sentences as severe as the death penalty. So scores of cisgender homosexuals are reluctantly forced into these gender-affirming surgeries in Iran, while many others opt to undergo the surgery to save their lives. In other words, not all who undergo sexual reassignment surgery in Iran have gender dysphoria, and therefore some of these transitions can be seen as an assault, assault on their bodily integrity, especially when it comes to trans women. This means that while sexual reassignment surgery can be a bonanza for trans people and allow them to maintain their bodily integrity, it is simultaneously an assault on the rights of homosexuals, both those born male and female, who are forced to change their bodies to be able to have a sex life that corresponds to their desires. So these examples are very different, the example of the US and Iran, which makes comparison somewhat challenging. However, what is important here is that both are examples of violations of bodily integrity supported by the state. Hence, people in the Middle East can clearly legitimately claim that Westerners are also guilty of abusing women's bodily integrity. The US has rolled back abortion rights for women based on the religious beliefs of a minority of Americans. And in some states, it does not make exceptions for the life of the mother or the viability of the fetus. In contrast, Iran, despite being a theocracy, allows therapeutic abortions under the gestational age of 19 weeks. In other words, abortion in Iran is allowed in the case of fetal abnormalities and diseases or when the maternal health is threatened. So Iran simultaneously respects the bodily integrity of trans people while disrespecting the bodily integrity of homosexuals, whereas many US states disrespect the bodily integrity of trans people and many politicians would take away the right of homosexuals to their bodily integrity. So to conclude all of this, what does this all mean for those of us interested in freedom of religion? I draw several conclusions from this overview of the intersection of religious freedom and women's bodily autonomy and integrity. First, the distinction between authoritarian and democratic regimes when it comes to religious freedom is not as stark as one would believe especially when women's bodily integrity comes into play. Western norms of human rights, especially of women's rights, have influenced the behavior of authoritarian leaders who now instrumentalize women's rights to project the image of a modern leader. This gender washing serves to clean up their image and to hide other human and women's rights abuses. Second, there is the perceived double standard of the West when it comes to religious freedom and condemning the practices of some Arab and Muslim countries. The West presents itself as morally superior and preaches religious freedom, while in some cases constraining the religious freedom of some of its citizens. This leads to distrust of the West in the MENA region and the Muslim world at large. The MENA public is aware of the contradictions inherent in the behavior of countries such as France in its treatment of its Muslim minority. Third, feminism and Western understandings of women's rights are rejected in the region as Western imports and as being incompatible with local values and religion. While some Muslim scholars have tried to bring together Islam and feminism in what has been termed Islamic feminism, the movement seems to have reached its heyday at the turn of the millennium and in the first decade of the century. And it seems to have fizzled at least in the MENA region. It's still quite strong in Asia. In all these contradictions, in all these contradictions leave some women, whether in the West or the Middle East, with diminished bodily autonomy and integrity, 
with either their religious freedom at risk or with religion instead being used as a cudgel to, to deprive them of those rights. So I'll end here. Thank you for it, your attention. Thank you, Professor, for this overview of the topic at hand and this critical analysis of both Western and authoritarian discourses on gender equality. Hello, uh, my name is Blessy from India. Uh, my question is how important do you think it is to be culturally sensitive um, while you're advocating or trying to reform religious practices that are discriminatory to women? Uh, just to give you an example, a few minutes from where I live in South India, there is this settlement of indigenous tribal um, a community called the Narikuravas, and they're basically a hunting and gathering society with almost minimal to zero uh, contact with the rest of the society. And they hold, their religion is animism, so they worship animals and nature, uh, and they have no exposure or no um, no exposure to any literature or conversation or interaction with the rest of the society. So they hold their um, religious values very dearly and strong. Um, now within this community, the men are very, very oppressive to their women. Um, so for example, the girls born in their families are not allowed to go to schools because um, they are very afraid that they will fall in love and uh, you know, go, go marry someone outside their community. Uh, the women, if they give birth only to girls, they are divorced by their husbands. They're not allowed, the women are not allowed to sit in chairs. They always have to sit on the floor. Uh, so very, very discriminatory practices like that. But uh, my question is, how do you deal with a community like that if you're trying to reform um, discriminatory practices? Is the focus on legal policies that change that or approaching it from a more uh, social reformation at the ground level? Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, now, I'm not an expert on India, so let me preface it by saying that. And I'm, I'm not an expert on non-monotheistic religions. Uh, my attitude usually would be to try to approach this from a social perspective, and usually when it comes at least to monotheistic religions, to try and find um, a less patriarchal interpretation of the religion, uh, a more modern, more feminist interpretation of the religion. I know that there is the possibility for these kinds of interpretations in Judaism, in Islam, and in Christianity, but I'm not sure about the animist religion you're mentioning. There's another question here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, I have a question about um, affirmative action. In a number of countries um, in Africa, because I work in the parliamentary space, um, there are efforts to correct what is, I mean, seen as an imbalance between the representation of men and women in, in most parliaments. In fact, where I come from, I come from Ghana. Currently, there is a bill before parliament, and the center for which I work is part of a coalition that is supporting that uh, affirmative action uh, bill. There are many who argue that you know these efforts are mere kind of token um, efforts. They just fill the spaces with people who are not really qualified, rather than having quality. I don't know what your thoughts are in terms of uh, the merits or otherwise of affirmative action through your research. Sorry, it turns off on its own. Um, I think what you're talking about is, is often in the liter literature discussed as um, you know, the use of gender quotas. Uh, these kinds of affirmative actions when it comes to, to increasing the number of women in, in politics. And there are many criticisms of this kind of um, 
instrument. However, I still think that we need them uh, because as long as we don't have them, we will not have women in parliament. Uh, women need to be given the opportunity, even if only to become tokens, but they need to be given the opportunity to be in parliament and to show that they can do the job. Um, we know, for example, an example that I've um, read about in Jordan, where at the local level, uh, they had a gender quota for women. And then after a few cycles, women started getting elected outside the gender quota, okay? Because they had proven that they could do the job, that they were reliable, that they were good politicians. So this is why I think that these kinds of policies are needed. And I tried to say that in my talk when I talked about the symbolic value of having these women in these positions. Uh, they will encourage other women eventually to run for office. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yes. Hi, my name is Raymond Horkus. Uh, I just, uh, I guess, had a question about, um, I think a concern that some people have about this conversation is uh, the, the turn or the, the way to strike the balance between the um, acceptance of women's rights and the embrace of women's rights and the removal of freedom of religion from these spaces. So I guess I'm curious about talking a little bit about how to walk that line between embracing what is a good thing, which is women's rights, but also making sure that the freedom to practice religion or belief is not then removed from that space because of that pursuit of women's rights. I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you rephrase it? <laughs> sure. I, I guess it's just the, the idea of um, how, how, can, how can a balance be struck between making sure that both of those rights are uh, held at the same time. If we're talking about uh, these being first freedoms, the, the, the freedom to practice one's religion, the freedom to express oneself, the freedom to live in dignity, how do we make sure that those things stay at the same level? But they're not contradictory in the first place. I mean, you seem to assume that they're contradictory and they cannot coexist while I think they can actually coexist very simply. Uh, one does not negate the other. Sure, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. Thank you. So, sorry if there's other questions you can ask or keynote during the coffee break.